right, everyone, thank you for coming today. Um, we appreciate you being here first and foremost. Um, well, today we have the principal industrial hunter at Dragos presenting his talk on the distinct imperatives of threat hunting and OT environments. And just to give you a little bit of insight on what the presentation is gonna be, I don't know if you've looked on his um, little bio for the presentation on the agenda, but it's pretty long, so I'll save you the time of reading all of that and just paraphrase, paraphrase it a bit. So, let's see. While IT threat hunting has been a common practice in the industry, it is rare to see that practice extended to OT environments. In cases where OT threat hunts have taken place, it is done by repurposing IT threat hunt prin principles and key OT aspects can get missed. For example, since threat hunters usually come from IT, they primarily investigate techniques motivated by financial gain. However, in OT environments, investigations must look beyond financial incentives to the sinister goal of compromising and possibly disrupting an OT system or process. So I'd like to present to you our speaker for today, John Burns. Good morning. Oh, good, it's working. Okay. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is John. Uh, so the marketing title is Distinct Imperatives of Threat Hunting and OT. The real title is just what are some of the differences in between IT and OT threat hunting and why should you have a different, um, an additional approach when you're doing your threat hunts in OT environments and then how to go about that. So uh, my name is John Burns. I am a principal industrial hunter with Dragos on the OT watch team, which is Dragos's managed threat hunting team. I have over 20 years of experience in automation and ICS. I started out in the field in various roles as a systems integrator, working in uh, programming PLCs and HMIs in oil and gas, water, wastewater, manufacturing, food and beverage, the whole gamut. And then I spent six years in a major pipeline control center helping to redesign their SCADA infrastructure for a SCADA upgrade. And then I stayed on and managed that and uh, assisted with managing that before going to Dragos where I've done architecture assessments, tabletops, vulnerability assessments, and threat hunting. Okay, so jumping in. Uh, so IT threat hunting is a thing. I think we can all agree, IT threat hunting is a thing. It's been a thing for a long time. It's, it's a common practice these days. The question that I often get asked is, is OT threat hunting even a thing? Can, is it a separate thing? Can you just take IT threat hunting practices and just apply those in an OT environment? While you can do that, and you should do that, because especially today when a lot of OT environments have uh, IT systems like Active Directory and Windows and Domains and DNS, you should threat hunt for those things that you would typically threat hunt in an IT environment, in an OT environment. But what I'm saying is you need to go a step further because you're gonna miss a lot if you only do those, those types of things. Uh, for example, OT threats have different motivations and different consequences to their environment. Uh, one, one thing I heard, one quote I heard several years ago is, what's the difference between IT and OT? Is that I, OT is mostly IT, but with consequences. So typically there is a very physical, real world consequence to an OT cyber attack. And then I'm gonna also cover like distinctions between IT and OT threat landscapes. I apologize in advance, I talk fast, but I got a lot of slides, so if you have questions, I'll happily answer them. So I'm gonna cover a couple terms. So IT threat hunter, or Intel threat hunter, sorry. So there are threat hunters in Intel, and the way I couch this is Intel threat hunters typically will start at the border, the perimeter of your environment, and go out to the internet. They're looking for those adversaries and what their initial compromise is and how they're gonna get into your environment through the IT side before they pivot into the OT. And the general output of an, I, of an Intel threat hunt is gonna be Intel reports, it's gonna be documentation, something that's gonna tell you what to look for so that you can stop them at the perimeter or at some point in your environment before they actually can create real world effects in your environment. An OT threat hunter like myself, I use that threat intelligence. I take the stuff that they produce and then I use that and pivot into my environments that I'm hunting in and then I try to look for the things that they present to us plus the actual effects that occur downstream of that as well. And then there are two ways that you can use Intel that I like to, I like to think of it as two ways. There is um, Intel informed and Intel triggered is the way I, I categorize it. An Intel informed threat hunt is where you're taking, for example, uh, the example I like to use is Zenotime. 
Xenotime was a threat group that was responsible for the Trisis attacks. So if you wanted to create a threat hunt around, around Xenotime, something that's established, you would collect all of the intel reports around it, gather up all the tactics, techniques, procedures, and then you would then go build your hunt and, and threat hunt on that. So that was what I call an intel-informed threat hunt. On the other side of that is an intel-triggered threat hunt. This is where you have an emerging threat that's popping up and you get a report from somebody that says, hey, this activity group is uh, targeting electrical sector in Australia, for example. So now you're gonna take that threat hunt, find the TTPs in that threat, and, or that Intel report, and you're gonna find those TTPs and you're gonna look directly for that activity. So that's something that's triggered off of an emerging threat. Uh, so let's understand the divide. There are differences between IT and OT threat hunting, and then there's gonna be some pitfalls for repurposing uh, your IT, just repurposing your IT threat hunts into OT and ignoring the distinctions that are with OT. So let's see. So things you have to think about are the motivations behind OT threat hunts. Yes, there are some financial, we see a lot more ransomware is out there, a lot more involving OT environments. But it's not just financial. There are also other things. There is process disruption. Uh, there is even like in the case of Trisis, the, the target was loss of life because you're targeting a safety system at that point. And then the, also the other thing you want to think about is you want to know that there are different assets and different processes in those environments. And it's very important to understand that the, so you can understand the distinction. So for example, I have two examples up here. Uh, Nmap scans and Oasis DNA. So I have these for a reason. Nmap scans, basically an Nmap scan is an empty packet ping across the network where it's trying to pull in and see what devices are online. However, in an OT environment, there are lots of software out there that does management of OT devices that that's how they do heartbeats. They send empty packet pings out and they look for those responses back to understand if the OT device is online. So if you're not aware of that and you see that, some systems can categorize that as an in-map scan and they'll think there's in-map in the environment. So you have to understand what's going on to understand that's not in-map. And then Oasis DNA is another one I like to talk about from my past life. Oasis DNA is a, uh, for those that don't know, it's a SCADA solution from Schneider Electric that's very popular in um, oil and gas pipeline control systems. Excuse me. Um, and it's very, uh, when it's deployed in Windows, it's very ingrained with the Active Directory structure. It does a lot of, it gets all of its permissions for if you can access a data point from the Active Directory side. So as a result, those assets, those, those workstations and servers are doing synchronizations that look like domain controller syncs because they're pulling those Active Directory records back. So in your environment, you're gonna see a lot of traffic passing back and forth that looks like domain controllers from non-domain controllers. That a lot of times is, the, is a key indicator of maybe that's uh, Mimi Cats or maybe that's a pen test that's happening where they're trying to pull those Active Directory creds back. But that's just an OASIS system, like the remote console system connecting to the operator workstation, trying to find out, can I give these graphics to this operator workstation to this user because this Active Directory user is requesting these graphics. So these are just a couple of the examples of why you would need to understand what's in your environment and how it differs from just a normal IT environment. So there are two different types of threat hunts that I'm gonna cover today. I categorize them in two broad categories. One is a structured threat hunt. So a structured threat hunt is your more traditional model where an, anal where an analyst uh, creates a hypothesis, develops the hypothesis, they scope it, and they're looking for something very specific. Uh, the best example I can give of this is I had a threat hunt I did earlier this year where I was looking for the SIP protocol, which is common industrial protocol. That's what Allen Bradley software uses to communicate to Allen Bradley devices. I was looking for that communications under that protocol to HMIs and PLCs that originated from outside of the OT, so from the IT or from outside the environment. So that's a very defined scope threat hunt. I'm not looking for anything else. That's all I'm looking for. And then uh, on the other side of that is what I call an unstructured or a freeform threat hunt. To me, this is more like an art form. You're just going into your data set, you're looking at your data, you're trying to see what is different, what's abnormal, what's, you know, stands out, maybe something, uh, some kind of anomaly. Uh, you're just going where the data takes you. And in this, this situation, I think it's better to have the more contextual knowledge you have of your environment, the better. 
And you have to have that knowledge on the fly because if you're constantly stopping to research what's normal in an environment, you're not gonna be able to move fast through the data to understand what's happening and catch that adversary activity. But if you understand your environment better and you take the time to understand your processes and your assets, you can then see more what is actually anomalous and what is actually strange, and you can dig into that. So I'm gonna dig a little deeper into each one of these. We're gonna start with structured threat hunting. So this is, a, uh, so I'll cover a little bit on hypothesis development using Intel reports. I apologize if you can't read it. I, I'll, I'll kind of talk through it a little bit. So if you were gonna develop a hypothesis and a threat hunt around, for example, Xenotime. Uh, my team and I did this a few years ago. We created, a, we created a threat hunt around looking for the Xenotime threat group. And what we did is we went through all the Intel reports we could find, both from inside of Dragos and outside of Dragos. We collected all the tactics, techniques, and procedures we could find in those reports related to Xenotime activity. We listed them out in a list of what they were, and then we mapped them to the MITRE attack framework so that we can have a better understanding of what we were looking for. Then what we do after this is we then look at our different data sets and our different tools, and we say, okay, how can I look for each of these in the environment? And then we record, we write down, like, here's everything I can do. So for example, port mismatch. So you could look for uh, SSH over not port 22 or something communicating over port 22 that is not SSH, for example. So you define what each of these are and then you define what you want, how you're gonna look for those in your data set. So for, this, for the second one here, common C2 ports were on port 4444 and 8531. So this is the search string we put together to look for that in our data tools. So we wrote through and we listed that and repeated that for every single one of those TTPs. And just the last couple, uh, these are a couple more that we did. Uh, sometimes you can do it just with a straight data pool and a search, but sometimes you have to take more of a statistical analysis approach. For example, this bottom one, the brute force, anybody that's worked in uh, maintaining systems will know that if you have one software solution that's misconfigured with the wrong password to attach to a service, you can have easily tens of thousands of false logins, you know, uh, unsuccessful logins, because of that misconfiguration. So if you take a statistical approach where you're plugging that all down into counts, now you're looking at individual types of logins and then you see a count next to it, it's easier to see the data set um, and understand what you're looking at. So the importance of aligning threat hunts with specific OT assets and processes. So it's, this is where um, we get into more of the detail of the OT environment. So I, you wanna align it to specific OT assets, and that's, that's important because OT assets communicate differently. Even if you have OT assets at site, this one site, they'll be different here. A PLC is not, a PLC, it's not the same. Allen Bradley communicates different than Schneider Electric, which communicates different than Phoenix Contact, which communicates differently than Modicon PLCs. So they're all gonna be different, so you have to understand what's in your environment and have that visibility to know what assets you have so you know what to look for. And then you also need to understand your industrial process that's going on. Understanding your industrial process lets you see what's gonna be the most likely target for an adversary uh, on the physical side. What are they trying to cause? What effect are they trying to make happen in the environment? And that'll help you prioritize what you're hunting for. Which gets me to uh, doing more of a consequence-driven threat hunt. So a uh, uh, crown jewel analysis if those of you don't know, uh, or CGA, is the identification and prioritization of critical data, logical assets, and communication paths of, or control interfaces that are required to exercise control and thus the uh, functions and processes within a system. So I like to use this method when doing, when prioritizing threat hunts in an environment, and it allows you to prioritize it from a most dangerous, most likely, down to the least dangerous, least likely uh, type of scenario that you're gonna get. And some examples of crown jewels when you would come out the other side of this would be uh, HMIs, PLCs, RTUs. Those would be things that would be crown jewels on the other side. So what, let's break down the, the threat landscape. So the threat landscape, oh, sorry, I forgot something actually. Uh, I'll, can you go back one side? Is it possible? Maybe not, okay, I'll just talk about it. So when you're actually going through the, the CJA, there are three questions you wanna make sure you're asking when you're going through that process to identify your crown jewels. 
One is what are the ICS OT network assets uh, and or their components that are critically relied upon to produce a functional output of the system? Uh, the second one is what ICS OT network assets and or their components are critically relied upon to maintain the safe states of that system? And then what are the, what's the network ter terrain that needs to be compromised in order for an attack on that safety system or that control system to be successful? So now we're gonna get into breaking down the threat landscape. So a traditional setup is gonna be like, you have your attack surface going from the, through the cyber domain into the cyber physical interface, and then on into your physical domain, your actual physical devices. So in a traditional control system, the level one controllers execute control logic, uh, and, that and then they also communicate with the level two supervisory control layer. And then in a, typically, a PLC and RTU, they generate control commands which are level one basic control based on input from the field. And that is in a, typically that's in a closed loop environment. And then that, and then they have control outputs and then they, and then they also interface with the supervisory layer and they execute su supervisory control layer uh, commands. So because it, it interacts in a closed loop on the control side, it, the attack surface, it's very difficult for someone to take advantage of that and to actually exploit the, uh, the, uh, the controller itself inside of that environment because you have to get inside of that closed loop and interface with that program and change that program and modify it. On the other side, due to where the supervisory control lives, which is up in the cyber domain, you have to, that it has a lot more of exposure to be exploited. So let's go through a, a bit the basic crown jewel analysis model. Um, so when you're doing a crown jewel analysis, uh, you want to understand your, what the functional output is or the primary purpose of the system that you're looking at. And what the, we do this because we can work to isolate and capture what's most likely and most dangerous attack scenarios of an environment that we face. And what, can, what we can do is identify uh, the, depend, the, sorry, the dependencies of functional processes that would most likely be attacked based on a given scenario. So when you're going through this, one of the questions you want to ask if, it, if it's your own environment, if you're the asset owner, you want to ask yourself or the people in the field, or if you're doing this for a customer, you want to ask your customer, what's a bad day look like for you? What would be a bad day? So you can then see what the physical effect on the other side is going to be that somebody would try to create. And then you can take that and run that through this model to get to what those cyber assets are that are going to be your crown jewels. So you would, start and you would start with system owner, which is basically gonna be your customer probably, most likely. And then you're gonna pull that down to the critical system or subsystem, which would be like a collection of assets, a facility, some kind of terrain like that. And then you're gonna go down to the critical function or subfunction, which is gonna be the actual process, heating, cooling, piping, distribution. Uh, and from there, you go down to critical components. This is the physical side of the cyber physical interconnect. This would be like your pumps, your valves, your tanks, your, your uh, flow meters, things like that. And then from there, you go to the cyber side of the physical cyber interconnect, which are your controllers, your PLCs, your RTUs. Once you've gotten to that point, you can then identify your crown jewels, which are gonna be things like the PLCs, the HMIs, sometimes domain controllers, gateways, just different systems like that. And when you're stepping through this process, each level has a, func has a functional dependency on the level above. So you can't step down to the next level until you have identified where you're at. So you have to go through this in order. And as you're going through it, there are three questions you want to ask. The first question is, what, uh, at what elements contribute most to the functional output I'm looking at? Uh, what functional dependencies do different elements within each layer have? And then where is my greatest functional dependency exerted upon the control system assets? So basically what we're doing with the control, uh, with the crown jewel analysis model is we're taking this and we're starting with the physical domain instead of the cyber domain. And it's allowing us to go down through and we're able to quickly map um, an uh, the required path to target by an attacker, which allows us to do some hypothesis generation that can be made by analyzing that path to the crown jewels. And then we can do some hypothesis generation around that path. So why is this important? In a Oh, excuse me. In an, in an OT environment for an organization, it can be very broad. It could be, there can, you can have small ones, but you can have bigger ones. Take, for example, a basic uh, river authority. 
a basic river authority will have things like dams, uh, pump stations, check stations, uh, treatment plants, and distribution systems. In each of those systems, there's going to be pumps, valves, tanks, filters, any number of equipment and components, all controlled by different PLCs, all interfaced and controlled by HMIs, both local to the site and remote. That's a lot of stuff. So sometimes that could be overwhelming as to where, to where do I start? So by going through this model and starting with what's a bad day, you're able to then prioritize that and know where to start. You can just go down your list from that most likely most dangerous to least likely least dangerous, and you have a starting point and like you can just go straight down those threats and straight down those physical effects until you find all the things you're looking for and you can then hunt for all those in your environment. So to, oh, there we go. Okay, so when we're doing this, it's good to understand what is affected to create a physical effect. So what we have here is, is a basic layout for us for a system based on the Purdue model, starting with the L4 corporate, going all the way down to your physical effect. So as an attacker comes in, what all do they need to affect to create that physical effect? So let's establish a, an attack path. First, we have the initial compromise, whether that's through phishing or watering hole techniques or something. The attacker gets an initial compromise into the corporate network, into the IT side, and then they're able to have an initial foothold and establish persistence. From there, they're able to pivot down and propagate into the DMZ, whether they leverage, you know, different tools, SSH, or they just use legitimate RDP, which we see a lot for lateral movement. From the DMZ, they're gonna gain situational awareness of the plant network. They're gonna, that's when they're gonna start pulling reconnaissance, they're gonna start looking at all the data and understanding what's going on in the processes and in the different uh, devices. And it's important to note that one way they're able to go from the DMZ to the plant network is in a lot of places there's credential reuse. So whatever, whatever credentials that the end users are using in the OT DMZ, a lot of times they're reusing those same credentials in the plant network as well, in the control network. And from here they go into intelligence preparation. So this is where they're gathering data and they're trying to understand what's going on and they're gonna develop the capability they wanna deploy in the OT environment. And then they progress into the plant network and that's when they're gonna start interfacing with the PLCs and they're gonna start like pulling programs and loading programs. And then they're gonna go into the plant control network and then they're gonna go into delivery of the logical effect. So this is where they're actually making changes to the PLC, whether that's uh, uploading a new program to the PLC or whether that's issuing supervisory commands to the PLC. They're actually making a, de delivering a logical artifact that's gonna make a change to the physical environment. And then that's gonna lead to a cascading physical effect in the environment, whether that's Something goes offline, the process is halted, uh, a pump like seizes up, a valve stops working, something's gonna happen. So I'm gonna step through the, some freeform th threat hunting, but basically why that's important is, I wanted to explain that whole process from start to bottom, because that explains why we, what we see on average for the dwell time of an attacker in an OT environment is up to six months. And the reason that that dwell time is so high is because they have to understand what's going on in the OT environment, what the process is, is what all the different assets are, before they can deliver that, uh, that, logical, uh, that logical effect to uh, create the physical effect. And the more you understand what's going on, that's the advantage you have over the adversary, is if you understand the OT devices and the OT process, you're ahead of that. So if you start in the physical layer, and you work your way up to the cyber, you can, you're no longer chasing the adversary through the network trying to find them. You're go starting at what their end goal is and you're working up to find them where they are if they're in the network at all. So I'll step through some freeform threat hunting as well. I'm gonna, it's, I'm gonna have screenshots of one of the tools that I use. Um, you can use any tool you want and reuse these same principles. But I'm gonna step through this and kind of relate it back to the, uh, the, the logical effects to the physical effect as well from the previous slides. So this is a, basically what I'm showing here is this is a statistical representation of the data, tool, the data set that I had available to me when I was running through. This is just a, um, a PCAP of some dummy data that's loaded into uh, one of my tools. 
Uh, and I wanted to show the importance of statistical analysis because in a small PCAP, I have over 1,100 records. And if you're just looking at 1,100 individual records, things can get lost in the shuffle. You can miss something or it could just take you a while to find it. Versus if you're doing a statistical analysis of that data, I've broken 1,100 records down to 24. So 24 records are easy to see at a glance, much easier to see at a glance than 1,100. And when I'm looking at those 24 records, the one thing that jumps out at me, for example, would be the cobalt strike C2 that's sitting right there in the upper right corner. There's three, three, yeah, there's three of those, and in a three out of 1,100, you might possibly overlook one of those, or maybe all of them if you're not paying attention. And like I said, this is a small PCAP. So if you can't read, I'm gonna talk through it, so that's okay. Uh, basically, if you dig into that cobalt strike uh, data set, that notification, you, what you're seeing here is we're seeing an enterprise workstation that is beaconing out to an IP address that's external to the network. So that's showing that initial compromise that the attacker got on the corporate network and they're establishing their persistence and their command and control. From there, we look into, we pivot into more data around that enterprise asset that was showing that it had a cobalt strike on it. And I'm looking for things that other things that that asset is doing. The first thing I see is I see multiple Seracata alerts for host. So I'm gonna look and see what those are. And as I'm digging through that data, one of the things that popped up here at the bottom that you may not be able to read is SMB executable file transfer. So now I'm interested into, I've got beaconing and I've got executable file transfers going on. So who, is, who are you transferring that file to and what is the file actually doing? So when I look for the executable file transfer, I can see it's going between the enterprise workstation and this other workstation that ends in 10.30. So then if I pivot into the data set, I can see that that 10.30 is actually an engineering workstation. So now I've got SMB executable file transfer between an enterprise workstation and an engineering workstation, which I would argue you should never have. My best case scenario is you sneaker net it through USB, through act antivirus kiosk before you move it over. Worst case scenario, I would hope you go through a DMZ. So then we pivot to look for we saw executable file transfer to the engineering workstation, so now I'm curious, okay, what's the engineering workstation doing now that that file got transferred? So I'm looking at the data around that engineering workstation, and I can see that it's doing, now it's got a potential cobalt strike. It's not verified, but it's possible based on uh, HTTP get with encoded cookie. And then I also see that it's doing some PLC status changes and some program uploads. It's pulling programs from the PLC as well. So now what we've gotten to is the adversary has moved to the intelligence preparation phase where they're gathering data and they're preparing to develop a, cap a capability to affect the systems. And they've progressed into the plant network, into the plant control network to, to actually interface with those PLCs. So what I'm here, here this is I like continue to look on and see what's happening and I can see you know, see, uh, PLC file access, status change of the PLC, and then we see date time change of the PLC and an actual program download to the PLC over SIP. So now we've gotten to the point of the delivery of the logical effect. So now they're actually making changes to the PLC, modifying the code and uploading the code. And then we see some few more status changes and program uploads, some uh, CPU locks and unlocks followed by a forced stop of the PLC. So now we've got to the point where the PLC has been force, forcibly stopped. So now we've gotten to the physical effect. So now that they've stopped the PLC from functioning, it's no longer controlling the process. It's not turning pumps on and off. It's not opening and closing valves. It's not monitoring tank levels or flow or anything like that. So now the process is halted. And in certain environments, that could be as simple as they fa everything fails to a safe condition and the process stops. That could be millions of dollars lost, or that could be if this system's offline and this other system doesn't stop, that could be something that happens, a tank overflows or you know, a pipe ruptures or anything like that. It could be anything that would cause that. So basically what I'm saying is, this is what, we, this is what we've done. If you started with, okay, what happens to that fiscal error and worked your way up, you're gonna meet the attacker somewhere in the middle and find them before they get down to that physical effect. And so that's, that's, what, um, get, that's the point. There's lots of different ways that you can threat hunt in OT environments. You can do 
simple IOC searches, which some people will say isn't threat hunting. To me, I think you're still looking for something. Looking for something is better than looking for nothing. So you can do simple searches, you can do hypothesis development and look for a huge like adversary campaign and do this big massive research project to do a hypothesis. Or you can also just pivot into the data and just start looking around and seeing what you're seeing. The point is, however you do it, do something. Look at the data, go in, you know, understand what's happening and just you know, go hunt. Just however you do it, I don't care, just go hunt because you're always gonna, you're gonna find something if you're looking for it, you're never gonna find anything if you're not looking for it. So, thank you. So, that went a lot faster than I expected, which is fine. That leaves time for any questions that anybody may have. Yep. You know, in the, in the, oil, in the oil and gas industry, chemicals, all these things, we, we have a, a process hazard analysis process, right? So we're going through and we're trying to define very similar to this where we're saying, okay, you know, what are, what's a bad day look like? You know, something got out of the pipe, fire, explosion, whatever, and then kind of work back and say, okay, well, what are the, the, the threats to that? And then identify mitigations and those kind of things. Does, does that PHA um, analysis, especially at a, a, you know, the oil and gas facility or something like that, feed into the crown jewel? Or are you, because, you know, there's a whole lot of, you know, like, for example, I, I'm, I'm, we have a lot of facilities on the north slope of Alaska, middle of nowhere, there's no other utilities or anything like that. You know, if you shut off the, uh, the wastewater system <laughs> and no one can go to the bathroom where they're pulling out buckets, that could be a pretty bad day after, you know, a day or two. Um, or you could just shut off the heat and people can't work. Um, you can freeze things up. I mean, there's there's all kinds of stuff that don't necessarily get into a PHA. So anyway, that was my basic question. Yeah, so, so basically what he's saying is in oil and gas, they do a, a hazard analysis, and can the output of that hazard analysis inform a crown jewel analysis? And the, uh, the answer is yes, absolutely. There are lots of documentations that you can, you can reuse from other organizations. So when they do that hazard analysis, they're looking at, okay, what could cause a bad day in the environment? So what you're looking at is from the point of view of the physical, is like what could physically cause a bad day. So if you've already identified what could cause your physical bad day, I could then take that documentation and say, okay, well, what controllers control those physical elements? Where is the cyber connection on that? And then how would an attacker attack those cyber elements to cause that bad day scenario? So yeah, you could, you're pretty much jumping ahead. You've already identified your bad day and you're stepping through the process. And then now we're just gonna go, okay, what's the cyber side of that? And then we can use that to then relate that to a threat hunt. That's a good question. Any others? I'm, I'm here, I'll be here most of the afternoon, so if you see me and you have another question, you can feel free to hit me up, I'm fine. All right, if there's no other questions, thanks guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>